and uh, I want to make the best of it. Uh, my presentation is about uh, London Bridge Tower, shard of glass. Uh, I had the privilege of working on this project for the past uh, four or five years with the Renzo Piano Building Workshop. Uh, it's probably one of the best conceived and designed building that I have come across because the building serves so many purposes. The building, yeah, it's a real tall building, what the tall building should be all about. Uh, first of all, is located in a transport hub where you don't need to bring infrastructure to it. The infrastructure is there to support it. A multi-use structure consisting of all activities. It brings people together to live, work, and enjoy the social attraction of a big city. It uses a brown field. It regenerates the area. It's the first building in the area that will totally transform the area into a beautiful place to be and to be and to work. An energy efficient building uh, with features like triple glazed, externally ventilated facade. Uh, even at the top of the building where you have no room to do anything else, the architect has used the space to create a multi-story radiator, a heat rejection system that uses, that's been used 45% of the year to cool the building. The design of the building, the form of the building, the way it has been conceived, with low embodied energy, it's by itself is a form of uh, uh, sustainable design. It will be an iconic building and it will form a significant part of London skyline. The height is 300 meet, 310 meter, 310 meter. Uh, number of stories 84 floors with 72 uh, occupied floors. Uh, we worked with uh, our friend Arabs on the MEP and uh, the client is several properties. Davis Langdon did all the uh, programming and quantity estimating. Mace is now the uh, the contractor of the project. Uh, this picture shows the location of the shard. You could see the city and the west end, and it's on the southern, uh, on the south bank of the uh, River Thames. As you could see, it's really on the center of a hub. You you have very close access to Liverpool Street Station, Cannon Street Station, Waterloo, uh, Charing Cross, Blackfriars. And you could get to Canary Wharf taking uh, Jubilee, the Jubilee Line and get there in less than 10-15 minutes. You could take the Northern Line, go to Bank and get immediate access to anywhere in the city. Uh, the logistic is quite, it was quite important for us because in an area that uh, the movement was quite important both during demolition, both uh, during construction. As you can see uh, on the right hand side, you have the uh, uh, rail line and uh, you have a major bus station on the north side. And I don't know if I could see this area. Uh, this is the uh, existing Sadiq Sade Tower that will be uh, demolished, that they are demolishing it as we speak. Uh, Jubilee Line extension runs to the corner of the site. Uh, they had a, we had a major uh, uh, water line, water, main, water line main, main water line right on the, under the St. Thomas Street, which is quite important. It broke when they were doing the uh, Guy's Hospital on the south side. So it was quite important that uh, the, 
the movement of the ground is fully was, was fully monitored. Uh, the tower form, I mean, 310 meter is not in today's term really tall. It is uh, the tallest in Western Europe because Bob is designing a little bit taller, <laughs> not little, maybe a couple of hundred meter taller in uh, Russia. We'll be talking about it later. But a 300 meter tall, six, seven years ago, was quite tall. Uh, comparing it to some of our other projects, like the Freedom Tower, it's half the height of Freedom Tower at about 600 meter. And Manchester Hilton, that you can see the Manchester Hilton on the right hand side, this is the one that won the uh, City of Asia Award uh, last, last year uh, is only 175 meters. So it's, a, it's quite a tall building. And this is the picture of, I mean, this is relatively uh, a well time Warner in New York City. Uh, the form of the building is quite environmental friendly and uh, structurally perfect. Uh, as you can see, if you do it, rectangular building, the, uh, the central wind exposure is half height of the building, but because of the uh, pyramidical shape of the building, uh, it's almost, uh, it, it is at the third from the bottom, so the wind has less impact on the building compared to a rectangular building, and just the shape, because of the aerodynamic of the shape, it the wind flows through the building much easier and because, again, because of the tapering effect, the downdraft of the wind does not cause much of a problem at the base of the building. The form of the building, it's designed and it works perfectly to its shape and to its function at different levels. Three levels of basement, houses all the back, back of the house, houses the uh, parking and MEP equipment, all the required, most of the required MEP equipment. Then you have uh, six floor of public spaces uh, where people can come and, and shop and retail. And uh, then on top of that, uh, you got offices which are from 35 thousand square foot to 25,000 square foot, which is basically perfect for a for an office accommodation. I mean, every, if you talk to a developer, they'd like to have 25,000. If you have a developer that wants to have a banking institution, they want 40,000 square foot. So it will take care of any kind of uh, uh, office development, office accommodation that one may need. Then on top of that, you have uh, plant space and the public galleries. Uh, by coming time you get to the hotel level, you are about 15,000 square foot, which is, again, very good. And uh, at the top level of the, uh, uh, at the top level of the re residential, you are at 3,000 square foot, which you could have a few very expensive 10,000 pound square foot building. Uh, when you get to the top, top of the building, again, the uh, the space is used, as I stated before, as a uh, heat rejection system. Uh, it has public viewing gallery, bringing tourists and bringing people into the building uh, at all, all, all year. So it's a place that brings everybody together. Uh, this is, again, a picture of the footprint of the building as you go up the building, as you can see. Uh, compared to Barclays Bank headquarter in uh, in London, you could see that it's quite comparable at the base, and then at the top when you get to uh, uh, to the residential and hotel, you could compare it with the West India in uh, uh, or Manchester Hilton or Holloway Circus in Birmingham or Time Warner in New York. So it's it's the, the shape is perfectly matched its, its function at each level. Uh, when we started the project, the basic, uh, the basic uh, issue, as any other tall building, was the lateral system to come up with a system that is best for the building and uh, is most economical. So several options were the study uh, uh, amongst four options of using all the core walls, 
uh, do add a little wing to them or uh, portalize shear wall with the portalized wing system, belt truss either at the middle or at the top of the building or a half truss at the top of the building. Uh, so all of these options were the studies during the early design. So, and we modeled it and uh, most of this was costed with uh, Davis Langdon and we got uh, information on it. So these are just uh, the wing wall system either, I mean the shear wall system either with the wing wall or uh, a portalized beam system like using the uh, floor members uh, moment connected to the core and the perimeter column to create a portalized system. Uh, again, other studies using uh, a middle uh, uh, outrigger truss. There are some pictures of ETAM shots that we did at the beginning to, to check different possibilities. Or a hat truss at the top connecting to the entire perimeter of the building or to engage all the columns on the perimeter. Uh, we also were quite worried at the time uh, for the uh, uh, vibration and uh, acceleration of the building at the top uh, at the top of the building because very expensive uh, residential accommodation so you are quite conscious about uh, uh, acceleration at the top of the building so uh, so the items that really affect this sort of this sort of thing is building mass and uh, structural stiffness damping uh, and uh, if required supplemental damping devices we, we did look at using a uh, mass damper just at the top of the building to see how, how it could help. It's similar to what we've done on uh, uh, Trump World Tower in New York City. Uh, we also wanted to reduce the, I mean increase the damping of the building and also reduce the dynamic part of the building, of the building by adding damper into the, uh, into the uh, outrigger system trusses. Uh, floor sandwiches was also studied into major detail. I mean, all of this, again, we work very closely. I don't know if Steve is here or not, Steve Watts of this time. We, we work very closely with them. We costed everything very quickly. We came up with numbers. We gave them the numbers and they studied it. Uh, the floor system, we thought at the beginning, how about all concrete, the combination of concrete and steel leather in the core or uh, using concrete fill pipe column and all, all of this is the study the different framing system in a steel uh, the perimeter of the building for the architect was quite important because he wanted to have as thin as possible a, a spandrel at the beam connection for the light for the building to be very transparent so uh, the building perimeter system was quite important so we, we studied the four and a half meter perimeter column spacing, 9 meter spacing, and just turning the uh, metal deck the other way to create that uh, and, and calibrate it out. So, so all of this were uh, studied 6 meter. And in all of uh, this analysis, uh, we knew that in, we need to maximize the uh, number of floors. The magic to the building was maximize number of floors to make it as efficient as possible. So in all of this, in, Options that we studied. The idea was to use uh, to use uh, castellated beam or uh, facet beam. They call it uh, cellular holes to run the mechanical ducts to them. And uh, uh, or alternatively, or tell, uh, alternatively, a study uh, a post tension uh, a banded system. And it's quite common nowadays in Australia or in, in, in part of the UK. And, but with this type of system, again, because of the headroom, we had to use the uh, uh, displacement system. So, the, uh, so you, had to, you, you had to run the MEP on the displacement system on the raised floor. So all of this uh, study, again, post tension flat plate, all costed, all the study. The, at the residential part, now again, because of the uh, uh, because of the efficiency of the building, we had to absolutely minimize the depth of the slab. So we thought in, in UK, 200 millimeter slab is really what you want to use. I mean, in US we use 175, but because of the cold requirement of the shear calculation, uh, because 
you can't do punch and shear uh, reinforcement on anything less than 200 mil. So, he, so 200 mil is really a good number for uh, this lab design. So, uh, so the, the idea was to use to, to see if they could use a 200 mil post tension slab at the residential and the hotel level as much as possible to increase the flow of <coughs> uh, For those of you who work in London, the geology of London is, uh, is well known. I mean, you've got paved uh, ground, a gravel, then you have London clay, uh, Lambeth group bed, tennis sand, and then chalk at the bottom. Uh, water is quite high, always very close to the top of the building, so uh, right from the beginning the sick and ball construction was similar to what people use in here, except that we don't put the second wall in front of it because the soil is not as corrosive as it is here in uh, uh, Dubai. Uh, so, uh, so using a sick and ball to do a form of cutoff was, was heavily considered. Top-down construction, basically, they, had to, they wanted to speed up the, uh, the construction. So uh, top-down construction was right considered from the beginning. And, and the, and the uh, later slides, I'll show sure you how the foundation is being, being done. Uh, at the construction stage, so, so studying all of these and, uh, uh, and going through all of this design, uh, the best way to design this building was to use its own natural structural uh, characteristic to create both damping uh, and use the mass uh, at the upper floor again to increase mass to take to take care of the uh, uh, acceleration at the top of the building and to uh, maximize the number of floors. So a hybrid system consisting of uh, the structural steel at the office level and uh, almost halfway up, half the way up the building and then we converted it to a post tension system uh, 200 mil post tension system uh, the lateral stability of the building was derived by using a very very efficient core uh, careful study of the core again with the we both our colleagues in Arab and uh, with Renzo Piano office. Uh, we work very closely to make sure that you have practically no transfer. Now you know that in a multi-use building you've got so many different lifts going from one place to another place. So careful arrangement of the uh, uh, lift system. Uh, we had about 45 lifts in this building, different lifts in the building, and four of them are double deckers, tandem, tandem lifts. So, so all of this is what was coordinated, positioned, and optimized uh, to make sure that it works perfectly. And then at the top of the building, we used the hat truss, go back to the previous one, using a hat truss to engage all the perimeter of the building. Uh, you can see this is the top of the building showing the hat truss and the uh, uh, heat rejection system. Again, all of these are utilized in lateral stability of the building, mainly to take care of the acceleration, to bring it down to 15 milli-g. Okay, the, the biggest thing to, for us right at the beginning was to minimize the number of transfer. The building, because of its tapering shape, requires, and on a, on a, on a, uh, hindsight, you require something, a lot of transfer, but the idea was not to have transfer. And again, working with a great architect, they com compensate for that, they work with you, they, uh, they uh, generate a building that is optimal. And you could see from this picture, as you come from top of the building, columns were introduced in partition around the core corner, and then it was landed on top of the core below, so it disappeared, no, no, no transfer. And again, as the introduced column, they sat on the core below. And so up, just basically no, uh, no transfer, uh, except, except I'll show you later. Uh, the floor system, again, the, the position of the columns were quite important. At the upper level, at the post
abstention level, we introduce them to optimize, to make sure that the span is no more than 9 meters, so that the 200 millimeter slab to work. And at the base, we brought them up far enough so the span of the beam does not go beyond 14 meters, so we don't use any, 15 meters, so we don't use any beam more than 510 millimeter deep. So that was the whole idea, so you could see Again, very carefully studied the location of the columns and we stopped them all at a different level to give you optimum, optimum structural system. At the base of the building, you've seen that the building has a backpack as an extension, it becomes larger. So, obviously, the system of transfer was quite important. But again, working with a great architect, you could work with them and you could find ways to use uh, diagonal columns very easy for either a frame or thrust to uh, change the spacing of the column uh, and bring it down. Uh, the foundation had again its own issues. Uh, we had to demolish the existing 22 story uh, southern tower. It has a lot of underring uh, piles underneath it. So, by plotting those existing piles and uh, by carefully positioning the uh, carefully pos pos positioning the new piles in between the existing piles, we are going to avoid uh, interference with the existing with the existing pile and by using a raft during construction if you find that one is not in the right place you just move it and we take care of it. Uh, again reinforced concrete was used at the lower levels. Uh, the form of the construction we envisage a top-down constru construction. Uh, this sequence shows you a, a, how we envisage on the foundation. You first uh, you, you first excavate to the level minus 1.7, then you uh, put all the uh, diaphragm wall or second wall in, uh, cast the cap in beam, uh, excavate down, take take out uh, take out the uh, existing piles, and then you remove the existing mat. Uh, you drive all the piles at that level. Some of them with plunge column, which is used to support the floor slab. So what we're doing in, in, in reality is that we cast part of the slab to laterally brace the perimeter walls during the excavation. So it becomes a little bit more clear as I go. So, so you can see that uh, the plunge columns are there. At that time, because we wanted to get the core started much faster, so uh, the idea was to put some kind of cover down right around the core and excavate down to the core because since it's a small, it's much easier to brace it against each other. And, uh, and then you could start the uh, foundation of the uh, core. Uh, you do a top-down construction, you cast the, floor, the ground floor slab and the floor below it to start doing the excavation put the raft on, and then continue going up the building. So hopefully in year 2012, we are all going to have the city view uh, in London. And uh, we're going to go to the top of the viewing gallery and we're going to overlook the entire London. Thank you.